Chesare, I like arguing with you. You have a certain way of putting things that makes you appear correct, and, indeed, I am not saying that you are completely in the wrong. There are certainly some absurdities, real or apparent, in the present social order. For example, I find it difficult to understand the customs policy. While here people are dying of hunger or associated diseases because they lack sufficient bread of good quality, the government makes it difficult to import grain from America, where they have more than they need and would like nothing better than to sell it to us. It's like being hungry but not wishing to eat. However, Giorgio, yes indeed, but the government is not hungry, and neither are the large wheat growers of Italy, in whose interests the government places the duty on wheat. If those who are hungry were free to act, you would see that they would not reject the wheat. Cesare, I know that and I understand that with these sorts of arguments you make the common people, who only see things in broad terms and from one point of view, disaffected. But in order to avoid mistakes we must look at all sides of the question, as I was on the point of doing when you interrupted me. It is true that the proprietor's interests greatly influence the imposition of an import tax. But on the other hand, if there was open entry, the Americans, who can produce wheat and meat in more favorable conditions than ours, would end up supplying the whole of our market, and what would our farmers do then? The proprietors would be ruined, but the workers would fare even worse. Bread would sell for small amounts of money. But if there was no way of earning that money you would still die of hunger. And then the Americans, whether the goods are dear or cheap, want to get paid, and if in Italy we don't produce, with what are we going to pay? You could say to me that in Italy we could cultivate those products suited to our soil and climate and then exchange them abroad, wine for instance, oranges, flowers, and the like. But what if the things that we are capable of producing on favorable terms are not wanted by others, either because they have no use for them or because they produce them themselves? Not to mention that to change the production regime you need capital, knowledge and above all time, what would we eat in the meantime? Giorgio, perfect. You have put your finger on it. Free trade cannot solve the question of poverty any more than protectionism. Free trade is good for consumers and harms the producers, and vice versa, protectionism is good for the protected producers but does harm to consumers, and since workers are at the same time both consumers and producers, in the end it is always the same thing. And it will always be the same until the capitalist system is abolished. If workers worked for themselves, and not for the owner's profits, then each country would be able to produce sufficient for its own needs, and they would only have to come to an agreement with other countries to distribute productive work according to the soil quality, climate, the availability of resources, the inclinations of the inhabitants etc. in order that all men should enjoy the best of everything with the minimum possible effort. Cesare, yes, but these are only pipe dreams. Giorgio, they may be dreams today but when the people have understood how they could improve life, the dream would soon be transformed into reality. The only stumbling blocks are the egoism of some and the ignorance of others. Cesare, there are other obstacles, my friend. You think that once the proprietors are thrown out you would wallow in gold. Giorgio, that is not what I'm saying. On the contrary, I think that to overcome this condition of scarcity in which capitalism maintains us, and to organize production largely to satisfy the needs of all, you need to do a lot of work, but it is not even the willingness to work that people lack, it is the possibility. We are complaining about the present system not so much because we have to maintain some idlers, even though this certainly does not please us, but, because it is these idlers that regulate work and prevent us from working in good conditions and producing an abundance for all. Cesare, you exaggerate. It is true that often proprietors don't employ people in order to speculate on the scarcity of products, but more often it is because they themselves lack capital. Land and raw materials are not enough for production. You need, as you know, tools, machinery, premises, the means to pay the workers while they work, in a word, capital, 
and this only accumulates slowly. How many ventures fail to get off the ground, or, having got off the ground, fail due to a shortage of capital? Can you imagine the effect then if, as you desire, a social revolution came about? With the destruction of capital, and the great disorder that would follow it, a general impoverishment would result. Giorgio, this is another error, or another lie from the defenders of the present order, the shortage of capital. Capital may be lacking in this or that undertaking because it has been cornered by others, but if we take society as a whole, you'll find that there is a great quantity of inactive capital, just as there is a great quantity of uncultivated land. Don't you see how many machines are rusting, how many factories remain closed, how many houses there are without tenants? There is a need for food to nourish workers while they work, but really workers must eat even if they are unemployed. They eat little and badly, but they remain alive and are ready to work as soon as an employer has need of them. So, it is not because there is a lack of the means of subsistence that workers don't work, and if they could work on their own account, they would adapt themselves, where it was really necessary, to work while living just as they do when they are unemployed, because they would know that with this temporary sacrifice they could then finally escape from the social condition of poverty and subjection. Imagine, and this is something that has been witnessed many times, that an earthquake destroys a city ruining an entire district. In a little time the city is reconstructed in a form more beautiful than before and not a trace of the disaster remains. Because in such a case it is in the interests of proprietors and capitalists to employ people, the means are quickly found, and in the blink of an eye an entire city is reconstructed, where before they had continually asserted that they lacked the means to build a few, workers' houses. As far as the destruction of capital that would take place at the time of the revolution, it is to be hoped that as part of a conscious movement that has as its aim the common ownership of social wealth, the people would not want to destroy what is to become their own. In any case it would not be as bad as an earthquake. No, there will certainly be difficulties before things work out for the best, but, I can only see two serious obstacles, which must be overcome before we can begin, people's lack of consciousness and, the carabinieri. Ambrogio, but, tell me a little more, you talk of capital, work, production, consumption etc., but you never talk of rights, justice, morals and religion? The issues of how to best utilize land and capital are very important, but more important still are the moral questions. I also would like everybody to live well, but if in order to reach this utopia we have to violate moral laws, if we have to repudiate the eternal principles of right, upon which every civil society should be founded, then I would infinitely prefer that the sufferings of today went on forever. And then, just think that there must also be a supreme will that regulates the world. The world did not come into being on its own and there must be something beyond it, I am not saying God, paradise, hell, because you would be quite capable of not believing in them, there must be something beyond this world that explains everything and where one finds compensation for the apparent injustices down here. Do you think you can violate this pre-established harmony of the universe? You are not able to do so. We cannot do other than yield to it. For once stop inciting the masses, stop giving rise to fanciful hopes in the souls of the least fortunate, stop blowing on the fire that is unfortunately smoldering beneath the ashes. Would you, or other modern barbarians, wish to destroy in a terrible social cataclysm the civilization that is the glory of our ancestors and ourselves? If you want to do something worthwhile, if you want to relieve as much as possible the suffering of the poor, Tell them to resign themselves to their fate, because true happiness lies in being contented. After all, everyone carries their own cross, every class has its own tribulations and duties, and it is not always those who live among riches that are the most happy. Giorgio, come, my dear magistrate, leave aside the declarations about grand principles, and the conventional indignation, we are not in court here, and, for the moment, you do not have to pronounce any sentence on me. How would one guess, from hearing you talk, 
that you are not one of the underprivileged. And how useful is the resignation of the poor, for those who live off them. First of all, I beg you, leave aside the transcendental and religious arguments, in which even you don't believe. Of mysteries of the universe I know nothing, and you know no more, so it is pointless to bring them into the discussion. For the rest, be aware that the belief in a supreme maker, in God the creator and father of humanity would not be a secure weapon for you. If the priests, who have always been and remain in the service of the wealthy, deduce from it that it is the duty of the poor to resign themselves to their fate, others can deduce, and in the course of history have so deduced, the right to justice and equality. If God is our common father then we are all related. God cannot want some of his children to exploit and martyr the others, and the rich, the rulers, would be so many canes cursed by the father. But, let's drop it. Ambrogio, well then, let's forget about religion if you wish since so much of it would be pointless to you. But you would acknowledge rights, morals, a superior justice. Giorgio, listen, if it is true that rights, justice and morals may require and sanction oppression and unhappiness even of only one human being, I would immediately say to you, that rights, justice and morals are only lies, infamous weapons forged to defend the privileged and such they are when they mean what you mean by them. Rights, justice, morals should aim at the maximum possible good for all, or else they are synonyms for arrogant behavior and injustice. And, it is certainly true that this conception of them answers to the necessities of existence and the development of human social cooperation, that has formed and persisted in the human conscience and continually gains in strength, in spite of all the opposition from those who up to now have dominated the world. You yourself could not defend, other than with pitiful sophism, the present social institutions with your interpretation of abstract principles of morality and justice. Ambrogio, you really are very presumptuous. It is not enough to deny, as it seems to me you do, the right to property, but you maintain that we are incapable of defending it with our own principles. Giorgio, yes, precisely. If you wish I will demonstrate it to you next time.